So, okay, just to kind of review where we were, go to the next slide there, Micah. Uh, we were talking about the way that not to shrink back at the end of chapter 10, but faith is, is something that pushes forward and endures. So that's going to lead us pretty much straight into chapter 11, which is called the, the Hall of Faith. <laughs> the Hall of Faith. It's going to talk about um, all the different examples of faith. And there, there's some issues that we inevitably run into when we uh, read this chapter. Uh, some, some examples would be like, oh, well, I'm not a hero like these people. You know, I, my faith isn't as strong like them. Uh, you know, and different things like that. And as we go, uh, we're kind of kind of look at those uh, things that people kind of object uh, to as they're reading it. Uh, but for right now, we'll start off at the end of chapter 10 and then going into chapter 11. Um, since there's so few of us, I'll just do all the reading myself. Uh, unless you guys <laughs> want to keep on being put on the spot. What do you think, Grace? You want to do? No? Okay, all right. Uh, the end of chapter 10 ends like this. But we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and are saved. So now he's going to use this as kind of like a segue to, talk, uh, to start talking about um, faith. So then in chapter 1, it's, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 11, it, it continues on. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by this our ancestors were approved. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. So, I mean, this is one of those verses where, like, you, I mean, you, you hear it a lot, and, oh, yeah, I know what that means. But if you actually just, like, stop and think about, now, what on earth is being said? It's a little bit harder to, um, to discern. And so I, I'm going to just say it like this. We're going to have to come back and talk a little bit more about um, this part where he's talking about what faith is. Um, Micah, go to, um, go to next one, next slide, next slide, next slide, next slide, and next slide. So it, it, it's one of those things where, where we're going to have to come back and kind of revisit a couple times. Um, but for right now, I just want to say that don't look at this as this is the, de the definition of what faith is. Don't, don't look at it like that. He's taking a complex idea of faith. And he is giving us a, 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 a basic um, subjective definition of faith. This is not, uh, it, it's something that's going to help explain and apply the Bible to his audience. It's not something that this, you can just say, this is what faith is. Um, so we, for that reason, we're going to have to kind of come back to it quite a bit. So it, it's interesting, I mean, it's important to notice, uh, to note, if you go to the next slide, uh, Micah, that faith um, th this verse is oftentimes misquoted something along, along the lines of this. Uh, faith is like this blind faith that you simply believe and you proclaim it and it is because you proclaimed it. And then people use this verse to kind of teach that. That's not what this verse is saying at all. It, it actually, the emphasis in this verse is on certainty and things hoped for. Now, faith is the reality or certainty, depending on your translation, of what is hoped for, the proof of of what is seen. And that, that's really the emphasis of here. And, and, and it's not that they're just putting this faith in this blind thing out there. Rather, their faith is, is focused on, on a reliable source. And that reliable source is, is God or the Bible, something that God actually said, actually promised. They're not just pulling something out of their hat and saying, okay, I proclaim that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in favor and I'm going to have money in my bank account tomorrow even though I didn't work and, and my house is going to be paid for even though I didn't pay my bills. And you know, I'm going to get everything that I wanted just because I, I, I proclaimed it and declared it. That's not what he's saying at all. Not what he's saying at all. Um, it's, it's not a blind faith. It's a faith that is rooted on God's promises and God's word. And he's going to build on that throughout the rest of the chapter. But what people do whenever they m m take a verse out of context is they just focus on that one part and skip the rest of the verses around it. So faith kind of elaborates. And from this, from this verse, from verse 1, we can kind of see this. The reality of what is hoped for and the proof of what is not seen. So what that means is, go to the next slide there, buddy, that faith is the foundation or, or it, it elaborates... Um, two things. First off, future things. This would be what verse one, one calls the reality of what is hoped for. That, that's future things. Faith looks forward in, in, to, to what's coming. But then the second thing, go to the next, slide, next point, there you go, is uh, faith elaborates spiritual things. And that if you look back at verse one, it says the proof of what is not seen. So faith kind of works off these two things, future things, seeing thing is, is something is coming that you don't see yet, and also spiritual things that you don't see in the physical. So it's going to kind of build on this throughout the chapter. Let's kind of move forward here. 
Um, this, however, once again, is not a final definition of faith. This is not like a one-size-fits-all. What is faith? Oh, it's the reality of things. Go for it. It doesn't really, he's, he's applying a complex idea, and this is why we're going to have to come back to it in the future weeks. Um, and so basically, the idea is you can either believe in what you see and what you feel, everything around you, or you can believe in what is beyond that. So you're going through sickness. You can be depressed because this is all that you see. See what I mean? It's, it's everything that you see and feel. Well, the situation is not going to change. Um, it's hopeless. You know, this is this is a bad. You know, all that, those things that you see and feel, your despair, your loss, all that. If faith is something that looks beyond that. And so for that reason, this is not an objective definition of faith. This is very much subjective to what they're going through. Faith has an element of faith. A lot of times I say things in a way that, that, that might make you think that it's either or. Okay? Faith is not a feeling. It is an action. Well, it's not so simple as that. Faith is a lot like love. And let me kind of elaborate. Faith has an element of feeling to it, where if you have faith in God, you might feel at times confident in the Lord. But that confidence is not faith itself, and it will come and go. Just like um, anger will come and go, all feelings will come and go. Your struggle will come and go. The struggle to believe will come and go. The struggle of, of, of doubt and, and worry, that will come and go. These are all normal things. But what faith is, is regardless of the feeling, not shrinking back because of those feelings. So I feel scared, but I'm going to push on in faith. See, and a lot of times what we do is we, we live in a culture that everything is about emotions, so we equate the two as being the same. Faith is feelings, and no, faith is not feelings. Faith is action. And in that way, um, it's a lot like love. Feelings uh, are not an accurate way of telling if you have faith. Well, I just don't feel like I have good faith because I worry a lot. Oh, okay, that doesn't, that's, feelings are not an indicator whether you have faith or not. It's not an indicator whether you have strong faith. Um, any more than love is decided by, by feelings, right? Like, you can have f butterflies in your stomach for a person. That doesn't mean that you love them. Love is shown rather in the day-to-day -day of how you live for that person, right? Uh, how you lay down your life for that person. It's about an action. The Bible says this, we know what love is in this, that Christ died for us. Faith is, uh, faith is very similar. F it has a, a, a feeling part that comes and goes, but that feeling is not a decider of our, of our, um, of our faith. So in verse 2, go ahead and go to the next slide there. Uh, it says, for by this our ancestors were approved. See, before Jesus came, how were people saved? Before Jesus came and people could look back and, and accept Jesus, how were they saved? People were approved back, back then by faith, the same as they are approved now by faith. See, the difference being back then they looked forward to what they knew God was going to do. Now we look back to what we know God did do. See, and so it's just because we're at the different side of the race doesn't mean that it's any less of faith. There's a, a, a really wrong idea. Go to the next slide there, Micah. Uh, there's a really wrong idea that um, people back then were saved because they followed all the rules or because they had the law or whatever. No, no, no. He's going to actually give us a bunch of examples of people who were saved before the law was ever even given. So in verse 3 it says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. So we don't see it, but we believe it. And once again, this is something that's oftentimes misused, especially in, well, in a lot of arguments. Um, there's a lot of times that people... Uh, try to, if you're familiar with the, with the religion Christian science, it's actually a cult, but in Christian science, um, they, they thought that they could simply deny or accept, and that's how reality was. So if you had cancer, you just simply said, no, I do not, and then you did not have cancer. And it, it was an idea. <laughs> it wasn't biblically warranted, though. Even nowadays, people are scared to say, they're scared to claim the sickness is what they call it. Oh, you don't say that you have cancer. Don't say that you have a disease. It's not claiming the sickness. It's simply that is the way it is. It, I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you like this. Look, Jesus says to come to him and bring, and bring your request to God. But if you claim not to have a request, how in the world can you bring it to God? I don't need healing. I don't have cancer. I'm not claiming that. Well, then you can't go before God the Father and say, please forgive me. Please heal me, right? You, you can't do that because you, as far as you're concerned, you don't have a problem. It's not claiming the illness. It's being real with it and taking it before the Father. So, okay, so as it applies here, a lot of times people kind of misquote this to say, okay, um, you can just speak it into existence. 
Well, I don't see it, but I believe it. Well, it, you, can, you can believe what is not seen if there's a warrant in God's word and God's character. But you can't just make something up and then say, well, I'm standing and believing in a faith. But does the Bible affirm that faith? Because sometimes we just, you know. So, okay, that takes us to a kind of interesting idea that I want to kind of flow through, but not real fast. And the idea of science, okay. A lot of times uh, religious people think that they can't like science. They have to just throw it away and dismiss it completely. And, okay. Here's the thing. Christian, Christianity, faith, and, and, and science, we, we both teach the same thing. We believe in the Big Bang. There was nothing. And then, poof, there was everything. Faith and science both agree with this. This is, this is The Bible teaches this. Science teaches it, too. This is not something that's, that's foreign. But here's the problem, is that science can't explain everything from nothing. That's the problem. When you talk to atheists, they say, yes, the Big Bang happened. Everything came from nothing. You say, okay, so what caused that, no- that nothing to become everything? Well, I don't know, but it wasn't God. So, okay, so what we're saying is that God caused everything. So then they always say the exact same thing. Ready? Are you ready for this? So, okay, so where did God come from? Now, not everything began to exist, right? But everything that began to exist had a moment in time where it began to exist, right? <laughs> Like God, for instance, God didn't begin to exist. He never began to exist. He always existed. But everything here began to exist, so it has a time when it was spoken into existence. Well, so God, what we're saying is whatever caused the Big Bang is something that is outside of time and space and is powerful and is personal because we can see from the created order that there's order and there's DNA and there's, there, there's, there's wisdom to it, so it's something that, is, that has knowledge to it. So atheism would call that nothing. That became everything. Sci- faith defines it as, well, that's God. It's something that exists outside of time and space. And that's exactly what it says right here in verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. We don't have, we can't like, here's my proof, you know, other than, well, here it is, you know. So that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. And an, an interesting way of looking at this, go to the next slide there, buddy. The interest, interesting way of looking at this is, making a distinction between science and faith. So science answers the question, what? What happened, right? You look outside, you see a thunderstorm. Now, you, you go to science, and it's going to tell you what's going on, okay? Well, it's these, you know, these positively, tra- positively uh, charged, you know, and all this different stuff that they're going to tell you about this, and they're going to tell you, oh, well, we can kind of predict where storms are going to be. It's going to tell you the what. What is happening? But faith is the only thing that tells us why. Why is it happening? Why should there be such order in our world? Everything that we see makes us think that it's all chaos. So why should there be order? Well, faith faith answers that. Faith and science uh, are not against each other. They answer two different questions. And so faith is definitely not at odds um, with logic or with science. You don't have to throw your brain away to believe in God is what I'm saying. You don't have to do that. Um, a lot of times, actually, it makes more sense. If you just stop and think about it, it makes more sense to believe in God than it belie- does to believe in nothing. The grand majority of times. So when we get to verses 4 through 6, and since there's such a small group here, uh, are there any questions about anything that I said so far? No? Okay. Verses 4 through 6 say, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts, and even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, now without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Go to the next slide there, buddy. And the next one. When I go through reading those, you're supposed to be flipping them through with me. Go to the next one. Oh, wait, no, no, hold on. Go back. Uh, I think that's the right one. Yep, that's the right one. So in verse 4, it said, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. So this is referencing back to Genesis 4, um, really the, the first generation after Adam and, and Eve. Uh, and the question being, one that, is, one that is oftentimes asked, why was Abel accepted when Cain was not? For those of you, you know, just make sure we're all familiar with the story. Uh, Cain and Abel both bring a sacrifice to God, but... Uh, Abel's is accepted by God and Cain's is not. And it doesn't really elaborate too much in Genesis to explain why. And uh, But we can kind of put some pieces together and, and uh, combining that with the book of Hebrews, we find out that, go to the next side there, buddy, his heart 
was right and Cain's wasn't. And another way we can know that Cain's heart wasn't right is because when God rejected him, it ended up in murder. And murder is the natural progression of anger, right? It just keeps progressing. There's nothing to really hold it back in. So uh, Abel was proved to be righteous through his sacrifice. Look at how this says this in verse 4. By faith he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. So it was, you could say that, that faith bears fruit. And for Abel, he, he proved his, his righteousness through his sacrifice. And, but then it says this thing at the end of the verse. It's a little confusing. It says, and even though he is dead, he sp- still speaks through uh, his faith. So go to the next point. Right there. Thanks, buddy. Um, there are at least five reasons, or five ways that Abel's Abel speaks even though he's dead. And so uh, I, I do have to mention, he, he, the author of Hebrews is going to come back to this in chapter 12. So just stick this kind of in your back pocket for a rainy day. Uh, the first reason, uh, or the first way that, that Abel still speaks even though he's dead is because faith speaks past death. So actions impact future. What you do today is going to have an impact on tomorrow. The second way that Abel still speaks even though he's dead those who walk in faith carry on that which was expressed in Abel. Kind of think of it as like a baton. When you follow the Lord in faith, you are, you are picking up and carrying on what Abel started. You're, you're moving his, his baton forward. Does that kind of make sense? So when we get to the third, uh, the third and go, go to the next. Oh, yeah, you've already got it, bud. Uh, the third uh, way that Abel still speaks even though he's dead, his unjust death speaks of his righteousness. So basically this is a testimony that Jesus and other parts of the Bible talk about this frequently. It's a part of testimony where um, the fact that the righteous ones died having been doing the righteous thing and, and those who are opposing God or killing them is a testimony to the unbelievers about uh, God and about faith. Um, we see this happens even with Jesus. Um, they, they hated him because he was righteous. And so the Pharisees and, and the Romans, they killed him because he was righteous. And so we see that that's a kind of a way that, uh, that his blood speaks. But then a fourth way, go to the next slide there, buddy. Uh, a fourth way that Abel still speaks even though he's dead is that his, um, his example continues on after him. So uh, another way of saying this is the righteous living continues after death. Uh, here's another way. Um, he is an example for us. That, that's how it is. So as he is still an example for us, he still speaks. He still has something to say. And then the fifth way that Abel still sp- uh, speaks is that in the, in the way that there's still the cry for justice. Okay? The Bible says that when somebody is murdered, the person who murdered the person is guilty and they should be brought to justice. Cain was never brought to justice. He killed Abel, and he was allowed to go free. So because of this, uh, his, his, the, the, the injustice of it is still crying out, um, and that injustice carries on. And um, that's something that's always true of injustice. Go to the next slide there, uh, Micah. So verse 5 said, By faith Enoch was taken away. Now who's Enoch? Well, Enoch was in chapter 5. He's in the genealogies where it's saying this person, the son of this person, and so on and so forth. And it goes through, I think it's 10 generations in, G- in Genesis 5. And one of the people there right in the middle is Enoch. And uh, we see from Enoch that he was resolute and he didn't shrink back. That's the example of faith. He walked with God, which pleased God. And so we get a little bit of a a math equation from from Enoch. Go two slides forward, Omega. There. This is the math equation of Enoch. He walked with God. And we know that. We know that he has faith and that he walked with God because... He believed that God was, and he believed that there were rewards. So let me kind of break that down. Go two slides backwards, Micah. So up to. There you go. It says, By faith Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. Enoch is a very interesting question, interesting character because it never mentions Enoch having faith in the story in Genesis. Never says that. He says that he walked with God, then he was not because God took him. But what the author of Hebrews is doing is he's kind of drawing some conclusions and saying, okay, so Enoch pleased God with his faith. And we know that he pleased God with his faith, even though it doesn't say anything about that, because it says that he walked with him. And it is impossible to please God without faith. So he's just kind of adding some pieces together. So let's move on. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Go to the next verse. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So therefore, we can know that he had faith. 
since the one who draws near to him, which Enoch did, he was walking with him, so he was drawing near to him, must believe that he exists. So Enoch believed that God existed and that he rewards those who seek him. So Enoch was drawing near, and he, he, he knew that God was, God was going to reward him. Therefore, he had faith. So since in order to walk with God, you have to believe he exists and that he rewards the seeking. So faith often stands on nothing but a surety of God's character. And what I mean by that is there's going to be a lot of times in your life when you have zero promises from God. God has not made you a single promise. And you're in a bad situation. You're asking for him to answer, and he doesn't answer. You're, you're, you're crying out for God. He, he doesn't answer. It's a time of complete quiet. You feel like he's a million miles away. He doesn't give you any surety. He doesn't give you any promises. You read the word, and it just kind of feels like you're reading a, a, a piece of dirt. Like you just, it just, It's not connecting with you at all. It's not that you're not desperate. It's just that God's not speaking. And uh, so you, you kind of read the same verse 14 different times trying to figure out what it means, and it just kind of sounds like noise in your ear. You're getting frustrated. Why isn't God speaking? Why isn't he answering? But there's a lot of times that that's going to happen. And faith stands on God's character even when you don't have a promise. Okay, Faith st- stands on nothing but a surety of God's character. I know who God is. He hasn't given me any, any promises. He hasn't. He, he, I'm in this time, of, this quiet time. I, it's very uncomfortable. I don't like it. I don't know what the word has to say to me today. But I know that God's good, and I'm standing on that. And a lot of times, that's exactly what Hebrews 11 is talking about. So Enoch stood on nothing but faith. He didn't have, for instance, he didn't have, go ahead and go to the next slide there, buddy. Oh, yeah, you got it. Never mind, you already got it. Uh, he didn't have the Bible to read. He didn't have a church or tradition to follow. He had nothing of that. So before we go to the next section, I want to specify that there are two main points. These aren't the only main points, but two big points of Hebrews uh, 11. Go ahead and go to the next slide, buddy. Uh, the first s- main point that you're going to get from Hebrews 11 is that there was no gain by the law. The people who he mentioned are people who gained, let's say, credit with God by their faith, not by the law. So that's a very big point. And then you go to the next one there, buddy. And then the second thing that you're going to see in in chapter 11 repeated over and over again is that faith requires action. If you say you have faith in God, it it has to be matched with an action somewhere, right? You can't say, look at my faith. I'm so so strong in the faith. When all that you really mean to say is you know a lot of things and you feel pretty good about yourself. That's not really faith, though. Faith is is followed up with action. And all these different examples you see in chapter 11, you, you consistently see people doing something. And so faith is not the decider of an emotion. If you're struggling and you're thinking, man, oh man, I just don't feel like I have it together. Don't worry about it. Feelings come and go. Don't worry about it. Rather, obey God. So we can move on to verse 7 now. Any questions? Okay. By faith, no, which you can go to the next, yeah. Uh, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, but an ark to deliver his... F- I'm sorry, I, I missed something somewhere. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fe- fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. Uh, he went out even though he did not know where he was going. And it's interesting because these verses in the Greek, they all start the exact same way. Piste, by faith. Over and over and over again. It's not just in English that it repeats by faith. It's, it's, it's in Greek too. By faith he stayed as a foreigner in the land, as, uh, land of promise, living in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking, verse 10, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff happening here. First, we'll start off back in verse 7. So go to the next slide, buddy. Yeah, you got it. It says, by faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark. So this is picking up the story from Genesis 6. And Noah is actually the first person to act in faith to God's message. A very interesting thing. So before, before Noah, people acted in faith for this or that, but they never responded in faith to God's message. Noah is the first one to do this. And it was his decision to act in faith that made him an heir. Check this out. It says, by faith he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. It was his faith that made him an heir. It also, it, it also says that his faith condemned the world. Let's look at that, okay? So go to the next one there, buddy. Faith made Noah an heir. 
Go ahead and go to the next one. It's, uh, um, there, there's two things that, that it mentions of how, I'm sorry, there are two ways that Noah condemned the world. And the first one is because he held on to Yahweh through the generations when the rest of the world didn't. Remember, there were no preachers, right? Noah held on to the truth of what he knew was right and following Yahweh when everybody else in his culture, they knew about Yahweh, but they went and lived in sin instead. But Noah held on to that. So that he, by, by him holding on to Yahweh, it was a testament against them. The second thing, the second way that Noah condemned the world is because um, he acted in faith while they acted in disbelief. So while he was obeying God, listening to God, and building an ark, they were all disobeying God and making fun of him and, and, and not asking to be a part of that. Yeah, I, I mean, hey, you know, you see this guy building an ark, you would think that you'd say, hey, my bad, I'm sorry, forgive me, can I hitch a ride? You know, but there's none of that going on, none of it whatsoever. And it didn't just, he didn't just build the ark overnight. I mean, he built this, you know, it took him some time to build it. So they had time to think about it, and they just refused to. And in those days, everybody lived in the same area of the world. So it's not like, oh, I didn't know that he was b- building the ark. I mean, we all lived together. Think of every, all of the world living in Roswell. It's going to be hard to hide a giant boat, right? <laughs> So uh, God spoke to him after he followed. Noah was following God before God ever spoke to him. And this is, a, this is one of the ways that, that, that God, in a way, knew what Noah was going to do by obeying him because he was already obeying him. Don't wait until God brings you to a place of testing to obey him. Make a habit in your life of obeying him now, and then you'll know how you'll respond later. I, I don't know what that means, but verse 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. So this picks up from Genesis 12. Uh, Abraham believed, so he moved where two things. He wo- moved where he had no one there, so he didn't know anyone. And he also moved where he had never been. He obeyed without question, which brings in as an interesting question that we were going to have a group discussion, but I, I, I don't think we're going to have one since it's kind of a smaller group. Um, was faith blind back then? Did Abraham and uh, Enoch and, and, and Abel, did they have to believe with blind faith, Nothing, their f- faith not rooted in anything? What do you guys think? Grace, it looks like you're really itching to say something. No, 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 that's not the question. Was their faith a blind faith, not really rooted in anything? So blind faith is where you're just believing something because you're choosing to believe it. Faith is where you believe something because there's proof to believe it. So do you think that back then they were following a kind of blind faith? Okay, yes and no. Kind of tell me what you mean there. Okay. Okay. So no, because so you're saying yes because he didn't know God on the level that we know him, but no because why? But no, because he knew he knew about God. He knew his character. Okay, okay. Anybody else want to build on this? Just give a couple minutes here. No. Okay, I'm going to keep going. If you think of something, we'll flag me down, okay? I would say the answer is both yes and no. Uh, in the same way, that really similar to how Gracie did. It, from a certain point of view, faith is always blind. Let me, let me kind of elaborate what I mean by that. To a certain extent, there will always be reason to believe and reason to not believe. To a certain extent. You cannot have absolute certainty in anything in the world. 
anything in your life, you're never going to. And not just faith, anything in your life, you're not going to have absolute certainty about anything. But there's a healthy level of skepticism where you can look at the evidence and say, well, the evidence really seems to imply this. Right. I mean, atheism is a great example of this. Well, I don't believe that there is, I don't believe that there's a God. Okay. You can believe that, but when you look at the evidence, there's actually a lot of evidence that there's a God. So you have to either ignore the evidence or just make fun of it. See what I mean? Like, and that's what a lot of the atheists do. That, that, I mean, they do that, but that's not really a thinking man's game, right? Thinking man is where you look at the evidence and you say, okay, well, I, it seems to me like there's more evidence for this or there's more evidence for this, and then you draw a conclusion. Um, but th- then there's something, go to the next slide there, Micah. But then, then there's something, oh, we're not supposed to be there, but more, more, uh, more, right there. Uh, but then there's, uh, the past skepticism is, is what's called hyper-skepticism. And where this is where there's never enough proof, right? So and, and, and there, there's a certain element of faith where you can never have complete certainty, but that's all right because you can look at the pool of evidence and say, well, it's, it's, it's pretty likely that that's true, Right, but uh, with hyperskepticism, it says no. I've already kind of formed my conclusion. There, is no, no amount of evidence is proof enough. And you see this happen all the time when you get in debates with people. Um, and you, this is why I say you can never force someone into the faith. You can answer their questions absolutely, and and you should, you know, ha- d- be in, in dialogue and and and, um, and whatnot. But you're going to notice that even if you have the perfect argument, you prepare it the perfect way, you answer every single question. There's always going to be more. And until that person's ready to come to God. You can't force them to, even if you have all the right answers and you say it perfectly. It's much better to establish a relationship with them and witness to them in a gradual way and, and love on them and that kind of stuff. It, it's a much, much better to build it up that way. <coughs> but I would also say no, they weren't finding following blind evidence because Abel's parents walked with God. They were in the Garden of Eden. They walked with God. Okay? This isn't like something that happened a million years ago. So they were able to tell him, yeah, we were walking with God over there. We disobeyed, so he kicked us out. Like, this is something, this is, th- he's, they're able to point to something, uh, not something far off. Enoch knew where his family came from. And he, he knew where he was from, okay? And he walked with God. He, there was something where he was carrying on a relationship with God. And then you get to Noah. Noah knew all those things that, people, that, that had been said, but also God spoke to him. And, to, and, and gave him commands. So these are things that, that, that no, it wasn't blind faith. They had reason for believing these things. Absolutely, they had reason. Um, a- when they went to Abram, a- Abraham knew about the flood, and he also knew about all the things that happened. He knew about all that stuff. And then God also spoke to him. Still, I would say that they had much less to stand on than we do now, obviously. Verse 9 says, By faith he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob. This is very interesting, and we're going to have to build on this more next week, but there's a kind of physical and spiritual element to this I want to point out. Physically, we, ca- we can come, oftentimes come to a place of saying something like this, I've wasted my life on not belonging. I've wasted my life on not having the house that I dreamed of, and not having the relationships that I dreamed of, and, and the job that I always wanted. I've wasted all my years on these things because I, I don't have anything to show for it. But then there's an, a, a spiritual element that says, well, I acted in faith, not of what was, but what would be. And I think we see that, that with Abraham, too. He could have looked at his life from a physical perspective and say, I've lost everything. I've moved away from my father's house. I, I don't know anybody here. I don't have, have a home. I'm just a wanderer in the world. But also there's a spiritual element that we, he could say, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's true in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense, I obeyed God and I followed him. And he brought me here. So he, when, when God called Abraham, he did not know that his descendants would inherit the land. He actually didn't find out that he would have descendants and that they would inherit the land until he was already in Canaan. But the initial promise didn't give him that. So he stepped out without thinking that there was a future and hope. He still stepped out in faith. So then he went to obey God. He did not go to possess the land. And then after he got there, God gave him more more details and whatnot. But before, he was just going out in, in obedience. Why in the world would God have me move here, right? But then there's an interesting thing that's said in verse 9. It says, living in tents. 
as did Isaac and Jacob. And you might think, well, that's an interesting detail. Why did he throw that in there? And he's actually going to elaborate, it on, elaborate on it in the next verse because it's a big point. His decision to live in a tent rather than the cities of the Canaanites showed his belief in God. So let's look at verse 10, which says this. Go to the next side there, buddy. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations. The reason why he lived in his tent instead of living in the cities of the Canaanites when he went down there was because he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose architect and builder is God. So his faith was rooted in what was coming, not what was. And absolutely, this life is never going to satisfy us. And there comes a point where we have to accept that because there's always going to be things. And we're going to look at this more next week. But it's something that C.S. Lewis constantly talks about in his books, something where there's this this ache inside of us that can't be filled with the world. So we keep going to different things, trying to find it. But but what we're actually looking for is heaven. And we'll look at that next week. But So the cities of Canaan Canaan and, and his father's tents weren't what he was looking for or else he wouldn't have acted as he did. Look at this. It says, who, um, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations. He's looking forward to something that's not there. And this is something that the next couple of verses are going to kind of build on too. So in verses 11 through 12, it says this. Go, go, I'm going to go to the next side. There. Yeah. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she, has, she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. And then verse 12 says, and this is the last verse we're looking at tonight. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. (coughs) So this is picking up the story from Genesis 18. You can go to the next slide, Micah. Um, Where Sarah is told that they're going to have a child, and in one year he's going to come back and Sarah's going to have a child. And she laughs. She scoffs. And this is not her laughing with joy. This is her laughing like a cynical, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So she laughs, and that's not faith. But look at what it says in Hebrews 11, or 11, 11. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to receive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. How is laughing at God's promise that? <laughs> How, how is that a thing? And you might say, okay, well, it was Abraham's faithfulness because Abraham had such strong faith, it was imputed to Sarah on her behalf to have the child. Nope, that's not what it says. I'll read it again. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered the one who, was, who had promised was faithful. It was not Abraham's faithfulness, faith imputed unto her, it was her own faith before God. So uh, we're left with this question, how in the world? Well, there's at least two, at least three ways. Go to the next slide there, buddy. There's at least three ways that Sarah showed her faith. Okay? First off, she followed Abram. Abram said, God called me to go down to Canaan, and what did she do? Let's go. She, she, she went without even asking a question. That's faith. Her spouse got a harebrained, a harebrained idea, and she went along with it. That's faith. Now, I'm not saying any time that your spouse wants to do something real stupid and unplanned for you, you go along with it. That's what I'm saying. But there was faith, and she responded to his faith with faith of her own. The second off, um, the second way that faith and that Sarah showed showed her faith is by having relations with Abraham in faith. Now, I don't. I'm not trying to be gross here, but there's these two, these two old people. When you get older, you just don't have the same sexual urges like you did when you were younger. You know what I mean? Let's just be honest here. Uh, I mean, when you're 20, you think you're going to do it every day for the rest of your life. You get into your 30s, and you're like, eh, maybe not so much. Your 40s, you kind of slow down. Your 50s, 60s. Well, you're in your 70s, and you're like, well, that ship's kind of sailed. But they're not in their 70s. They're getting up past their 70s. <laughs> And so this is not really the time that, that really they would have that much energy <laughs> to do that kind of stuff. But after the promise was given, Sarah and Abram made the choice to be intimate with each other, knowing what was promised. And I would argue that that intimacy that they shared together was itself an act of faith. Because they knew what God promised, they came together, and they tried to bring it about. I would say that that's an act of faith. So she struggled with feelings of cynicism, at least in to- at, at times, but in the end, she ended up carrying the child in faith. And that takes us to the third f- show of, of, of Sarah's faith, she carried the child. 
Now, let me kind of build on this because it might not seem that important at first glance. Over the year of her laughing at God to having a child, her faith grew, evidently, because she had the child. So when we read the verse, it says this. She, uh, since she considered that the one, who, I'm sorry, she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to see children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered what the one who had promised was faithful. So I would argue this. I would say that her ability to conceive was granted because of her faith. See, the promise was given her aside, aside from her personal faith in that moment. Her and Abraham had obeyed. God gave a promise. She responded with cynicism. God said, don't laugh. Don't laugh. And so then after that moment of weakness of faith, what did she do? Well, she put her faith back in God. She came together with her husband. Very important details here. And it was that faith that allowed her to conceive. See, the promise and the conception are two different things. God gave the conception. She laughed. But after that... It was her faith that caused her to conceive. Her faith accomplished what the promise was. See how that was? Faith moves you into action to fulfill God's promised word. See how that works? It's a very important, very important detail because what we do is we look at our failures of faith and we say, I don't have enough faith. And we're going to look at this more in the future. I'm not a hero like the people in this chapter, and that's just not, not, not true. So the promise for the child was met with this belief initially, but both before and after that event, she showed faith. And obviously, if Abraham, Abram's faith impacted her faith as well. We see that in the end of cha uh, beginning of chap verse 11 and verse 12. Go to the next slide there, buddy. It says, by faith, even Sarah herself, and then in, ver in verse 12, therefore from one man. And so we see here the idea that, yes, Abraham did have an impact on her faith. Absolutely. When you have two believing spouses, it really urges each other on. Absolutely. But um, that's not to downgrade Sarah's faith. So verse 12 says this. Go to the next slide there, buddy. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, because he was so old, uh, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. So uh, it, this is something that's impossible. It was impossible for these elderly people like this to have a child. Impossible. And yet... They still did. From nothing, now this is important, from nothing came a multitude of Israel. You got two barren old people. Well, she was barren, he wasn't. But you got these two old people, right? They can't have kids. They were barren. Nothing was happening. But from that nothingness came a multitude. And this is actually a reflection of the creation event itself. From nothing, God created everything. In the same way, from Sarah's barrenness, she created the nation of Israel. He created the nation of Israel and then brought the Gentiles in to make the nation of God's, God's people. So the Hebrews uh, can obviously read these examples that is being said and they can imitate these examples and say, hey, look, this is something that very much applies to us in our situation. Um, remember, their, 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 their thing about going back to Judaism because it's more familiar and kind of getting away from the problems. And so it's something that they're struggling with. And so these examples, in fact, I would encourage you to read through chapter 11, but pretend that you are a Jew who is converted to Christianity and you're thinking about going back to Judaism instead of sticking with it with Jesus. And then read through chapter 11 and see how much of it really has something to say to you. Um, not to say that it doesn't have anything to say to us today. but So faith causes us to take our eyes off of what we see, whereas what we see causes us to squash our belief. We look around us and we see loss and pain and, and it hurts and we just don't see God in that. But faith causes us to redirect our focus and redirect our eyes. It's like that song, turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. So faith is choosing to redirect your focus. Instead of sitting there staring at all the things that are bothering you, faith is where you redirect what you're staring at, what you're focusing on. Um, and I'm not talking about naming and claiming. I'm talking about being rooted in God's promises and character, which is something completely different. So an example of this would be, well, okay, I'm dealing with this. It seems like a hopeless situation, whatever it is. God is going to intervene for me, no, no matter what I go through, because I know his character. I know that he's going to intervene for me. That doesn't, 
It doesn't mean that I'm not going to have struggles. It doesn't mean it's going to go how I want it to go. But I know God's character. I'm going to keep crying out to him because I know he's going to answer me. Maybe not in the way that I want him to, but he will answer me. So I'm going to hold on to that. And that's exactly what we see with Sarah and Abram. And we're going to stop there. But uh, there's, uh, that's, that's really what the, um, what the author of Hebrews is building on. And we're going to take um, probably another two weeks to get through chapter 11. We want to make sure we don't skip anything, but I don't want to kind of belabor the point. So next week we'll probably go through somewhere in the um, 20-something verse. Maybe, maybe we'll go to t- verse 25 or 28, somewhere in there next week. And then we'll uh, finish up to verse 40 in the week after that. Uh, so Genesis 15 uh, makes the comment of Abraham. It says, he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that is um, really a good way to summarize what we've looked at tonight. Uh, there is no s- special su- summary I'm giving this week like I always do because um, we're not done with the section. So I'll give you the summary at the end of chapter 11. Go to the next slide there, buddy. Um, just uh, by way of mentioning things, uh, what we've got going on. Micah, go to the next slide. Uh, what we've got going on is uh, we are in loan payoff month. So um, we've got a couple things going on to um, help get the church loan down. The Bible says to flee from debt, and so that's what we're doing. We're fleeing from it. Uh, if you have any questions about that, I'll mention it in more in depth on Sunday, and there will also be um, a section of the bulletin just talking about this. Lord, thank you for tonight. Uh, I just pray you'd uh, be with those who came tonight and just uh, bless them, help them to have a good rest of the week. And, uh, Lord, that you would just continue to... Uh, to to to, folk, uh, to to hear our prayers and to and to answer us when we call out to you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We trust you. Amen.